Some of you remember Christine Huke from Germany. Yeah. Christina. Christina. Huka? Huka. There you go. Uh, young lady that was with us in the old other location for quite a while and had to go back to Germany. Uh, her niece, Lotta, young girl, 13, 14, has developed an eating disorder, really dire straits. She said it's related to the COVID, the lockdowns, the, the destruction of our youth. So we're going to, I'm going to pray for her if you'd pray with me. But as we enter into this prayer, if I could get your attention for a minute. You know what Ronald said the first time, first half about it's time to use these things. The danger of the, the temptation of studying all the time is, is just degenerating down into it being a study. It being about knowledge. Maturity, knowledge is not maturity. Maturity is the capacity to love. It's using knowledge to develop the capacity to love unconditionally. So if you want to check your maturity in the difficulties of your life with other people, how capable are you of resisting the temptation to be bitter or angry or react and showing love, trying to edify? That's maturity. And so as we go into this prayer, I'm going to say a prayer. And we're going to talk about relationships. We're basically marriage is Ron. We're doing that this month. I want you to ask yourself if you're willing to apply these things. If you're willing to be someone who's, who's able and committed to showing unconditional love to your loved ones. Or are you simply committed to continuing to try to get from them what you want, what you think you deserve or what they owe you, because those are two incompatible systems. So I'm going to say a prayer and I'm just going to encourage you to not hear this as just another Bible study. Any of these lessons, especially this month, if we can't get our marriages on track in this church, we won't have a ministry. We'll just have an academic ministry. But if we can't get our marriages on track and let that flow into our children and our loved ones and our fellow believers, that's the ministry. Ministry is love. It's truth, but it's to become love. So let's go to the Lord. If you need to confess anything, then go ahead. Well, Father, I stand convicted by this first half of teaching about my soul and my heart and the way I've conducted myself so selfishly in my relationships, just expecting others to give me what I want or need or thought they should rather than surrendering that and looking for it from you. So I pray that you, these lessons on marriage and, and relationships can hit home for us in a way that we're willing to change our own self. And I hope these words hit home, Father. I pray for this young lady, Lotta, for her body, her healing, her mind, whatever this, the circumstances of her life have crashed in on her and caused her to believe and think things that are simply untrue and unhealthy. I ask that you bring about some kind of change in her to help her become healthy. I pray that if she's not saved, that the gospel will be made clear. I thank you, Father, for all your grace and mercy in my life and our life. And I pray that our church, Grace Valley Bible Church, could have a tremendous impact, not just beyond, but in this community. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. All right. My topic today is going to be bitterness. It goes along with what we're talking about in marriage. Uh, there's a lot of reasons people don't get along in marriage. Incompatibility. 
They're very different. They have difficulty uh, connecting in that way. A lot of people come in with bad patterns of relating because of family. Their family of origin has left them damaged with baggage. Uh, one person has worldly goals and one person has spiritual goals. Quite often, what one that's overlooked is that both husband and wife misunderstand the biblical commands. The man sees too much in the command to, quote, be the authority, although that's not, he's not commanded to be the authority. That's addressed to the woman. And the woman doesn't understand that submission is a ministry of unconditional love to her husband. So, a lot of reasons. But at any point in your life, when adversity comes to you, you don't get what you want or it's contrary to what you believe, and you react, and you fail to recover, you fail to confess, you fail to see the truth of it, you fail to understand what God's doing, then you begin to move away from your spiritual life. And you lose your spiritual momentum. And you lose your capacity to face the issues of your life. And you end up withdrawing from the battle in your life, quitting and escaping. You escape into some fantasy land or you escape into some substance or, you know, you watch television 24 hours a day or whatever it is that you use to medicate yourself from standing firm and in, in growing into the challenge of your relationships. They're hard. They're not what you think they are. They're not, what you, they're not supposed to give you what you've decided they're supposed to give you. And God has a purpose for them. When we, when we react and become bitter, I mean, we've had enough. I've had enough. I've gone through this with you so many times and so many times. It never changes. Nothing ever gets any better. You're not ever going to change. Of course, I pretend that I am going to change, but I'm not. Well, then you stop striving for oneness. You stop striving for it. And you just, you just separate within the home. You separate within the home. You quit, withdraw, and escape. And, and this is related to bitterness. Now, I want to offer you a different way of thinking about your life. God knew that Adam's sin would destroy the divine order, causing our lives to be filled with sin and adversity. He knew that. So he designed the universe in such a way that he could use our adversities and even our failures to bless us. The adversities that you're facing right now have been allowed by God to bless you. Now, are you willing to believe that? Are you willing to stop being angry because you didn't get what you wanted or the other person didn't cooperate with truth and the truth is they're not able to give you what you want. That's God's job. But so God uses our adversities to humble us, to expose our selfishness and human viewpoint and use and then he uses them as an opportunity to prove out his word. As we use his word in the difficulties of life and he gives us victory, it proves to the universe about the validity, the power, the righteousness of his word. This is your opportunity. Played shortstop as a kid. My dad hit me hundreds and hundreds of grounders. I got to where I didn't want to do it anymore. He said, no, we're going to do it. And he would hit them in short hops and low, slow rollers and everything, hundreds of them. It was overwhelming. But when the game time came, I was ready. I'd seen it all. I'd applied it all. I had practiced it all. You know, if you're trying to squeeze what you want humanly, earthly out of your life, <laughs> 
Well, good luck with that. It's not going to work. Doesn't work for anybody, even if it looks like it. It's not what it's for. The adversities in your life are for your growth, for your practice, for your humility. So, and, and you say, well, you don't understand how bad it is. Well, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. But I don't think it matters, really. Unless, in marriage, unless it's time to divorce. If it's not, you don't have grounds to divorce and God doesn't want you to leave it. Then he wants you to stay in it and he wants you to keep trying in it and he wants you to keep striving to become one in it. And the only way you can strive to become one in your marriage is by changing yourself. Because you've tried changing the other person. How did that work for you? So, now, I've been asked not to include my own personal life in this, so I will try to avoid that, but that's my nature. And Rhonda, if I do, you're just going to have to forgive me. But I've not been the best husband. So these lessons come out of my life because I've lived this. I've lived this. So, and listen, if you're married for any length of time, you've lived this. This view that God has allowed our adversities for our benefit requires that we believe that what he allows, what we call good and bad, is his will for us in that moment and is intended to bless us. If God didn't want you going through it, you wouldn't be going through it. You say, well, I made a mistake. I married the wrong person. Well, guess what? You're married now, and God wants to turn both of you into the right person for each other, for him. It's no other option. If you're gonna take this, if you're gonna approach this as a Christian, you have to stop making excuses for yourself for not entering in and humbling yourself and being willing to change and enter into this relationship and try to do what God said to do in your relationship. There's no excuse. So don't pretend that there's some reason why you just can't do it. Now, can you just buck up and do it? No. You have to regain your spiritual momentum. You have to confess your sins. You have to acknowledge to God what's going on that's not right. And you have to get back to the Word. You know, the times in my life, like right now, when I was really spiritually motivated, I listened to all kinds of people. I was hungry all the time. But, and this is not a criticism, it's just a fact that I see. There are Saturday morning, Rick Broadhead and I teach Bible classes. Sunday night, I teach Bible classes every week. And nobody's, nobody attends. Nobody's hungry for it. I'm not, I don't think you have to listen to me. It's just about there's the Word of God being taught, available, wide open. And where's your hunger? You know what that says? That you're distracted by other things. And again, that's not about me. It's about an indication of where is your heart? What is of interest to you? Where are you pursuing? What are you striving for? So you've got to return to the Word of God in your life. You've got to return to God and be willing to obey. That's when you begin moving again spiritually and develop. Your soul opens back up from the hardness. And you can start to forgive again. And you can start to laugh again and, and be peaceful again. You move back toward God. Because your marriage is about God. It's about a picture of Christ in the church more than it's ever about what you need from it. Now, if you're not capable of caring that it's about Christ in the church, you go, I hear that. I know it's true, but I can't care about that. I'm too caught up in myself. I understand that. This is where your spiritual life will, will free you from that 
self-pity and bitterness and blame and criticism and help you stop making excuses for not doing the will of God. Now I am talking to me. So, here's bitterness. Genesis 4, Cain. God said, bring a sacrifice. Abel brought an animal sacrifice, which was a picture of Christ on the cross. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was the purpose of the animal sacrifice. Cain, no, no, I'm not going to obey God. I'm not going to do it. I want to do it my way. So he's a farmer. He brings the best of his crops. He's going to do it his way and offer God his best. He's the first religious guy. Well, God comes and says, he rejects it. He says, look, if you, if you do the right thing, if you come and accept the message of the sacrifice and perform the right sacrifice, everything will be great. But he rejects that because he wants to do, he wants what he wants. And his rejection of God's will in his life led him into bitterness, hatred, and what? Murder. That's the process. That's where it leads you. You say, well, I'm not going to murder my husband. <laughs> well, <laughs> it ain't over yet, but you may want to. You may feel that way. You may, you may feel that way toward each other. And that's, you're moving the wrong way now. How about Ruth? You know, she lost the two men and the three men in her life, her husband and two sons. And her reaction, rather than humble herself before the Lord and accept his will for her life is something that he was doing to grow her into greatness, spiritual greatness. She said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. She became bitter. God allowed the men to die, and rather than surrender to his will, she became bitter and rebelled. Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered toward them. Husbands' expectations aren't met. Rather than accept that God is allowing his wife to grow out of whatever non-biblical behavior and into a wife who gives out of love for the Lord, instead of letting her grow, helping her grow, nurturing her to grow out of unconditional love, he demands. Demands. And then if he doesn't get what he wants, he's angry, resentful. You owe me. And listen, if that's where you are, that's, that's normal, sinful human behavior. If that's where you are, in anything, it, it doesn't have to be your marriage. Any relationship or any situation, maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your health. Anything that God has allowed in your life that's not what you want it to be, instead of surrendering and embracing what God has allowed you hold on to what you want that's not of God and you react and become angry and bitter when you can't have it. That's James chapter 4. So, what is bitterness? The Hebrew mara literally means sour or having a bitter taste. This is Exodus 12, 8, talking about the bitter herbs associated with the, pass, the Passover. Proverbs 5, 4 talks about wormwood, where an alcoholic beverage named absinthe come from. It's a, it's a bitter liquid, bitter plant. But figuratively, which is the meaning, <clears throat> it means to be angry, to be harsh, to feel grief, to be in pain, to feel hurt, and be discontent. And, and it's almost always a response to loss. A response to loss or, the, or the, a response to the imagined, imagined loss. Like Genesis 27, 34, you know the story of Jacob and Esau? How Jacob tricked Isaac into giving him the birthright blessing 
Of course, Esau had sold it years before. He didn't care about it when, but he didn't care about it until he lost it. Jacob took it. Then he cared about it. So what did he do? He became bitter. What did he want to do to Jacob? He wanted to murder him. See, it leads you to hatred. Real hatred. Not, not this pretend hatred that the world talks about now. Real hatred. 2 Samuel 2, 26. Uh, Abner told Joab, they said, if you keep pursuing killing your brothers in these different tribes, the tribe of Benjamin, there's never going to be the end to bitterness. Jeremiah 31, 15. Bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, the prophecy of what happened during the time of Christ. The Greek word, pikros, means sharp or pointed, having a bitter taste. It means to have a resentful attitude, to be harshly uh, reactive, to be angry, cruel, malignant, hateful. James 3.14, bitter envy and rivalry. He compares that with the wisdom of love. In Hebrews 12, 15, which we're about to look at, the root of bitterness. So bitterness is associated with grief and weeping because of personal loss. Personal loss. So, again, Esau, Peter. Peter went, you know, we, in the third denial, Luke says he looked up and the, and the Lord Jesus Christ was looking right in his eyes. And he went out and wept bitterly. So what did he lose? What did Peter lose? I'll tell you what he lost. He lost this image of himself as strong and loyal and faithful. He thought he was all that. And listen, in the human sense, he probably was. But we're way beyond human ability and effort trying to enter into this most pressured event in human history, spiritually pressured, he could, his human ability and his human commitments could not hold up. So it crashed his system, blew him away, and he just was broken. Best thing that ever happened to the guy. You go, well, why, how can you say that? I mean, he is in misery, yeah. And then he, he tried to quit. He said, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I'm just not strong enough to do it. And the Lord came back and said, son, come on, Peter, get back with the program. Confess your sins and move back toward the Lord. <clears throat> Open your heart to the word of God again and start taking it into your life again. Stop being lazy. Stop being distracted. Stop making excuses for not using your, this life for spiritual purposes. This is the only reason we're here is for spiritual things. That's the only reason you're here. You're, what, you're, you're living out this life and you're going to the next. And what you accomplish spiritually here is going to carry with you into the next. That's the only reason we've been left in this life. We're already children of God, citizens of heaven. Why doesn't he take us home? Because he's given us the privilege of fighting in this world. And, and proving out his word and proving out his love. And this is what's going on in your relationship. You think it's about you and not getting what you want. Or somebody doing something they're not supposed to do. It's about making you into the person God designed you to be. That's what it's about. So... It's associated with loss. This loss of something that we want. And so we, we reject God's will to pursue like the love of money. We despair over loss and it causes bitter weeping. So our personal agenda becomes frustrated. We lose hope leading to bitter weeping. When your happiness and your heart is connected to the earthly, the earthly will always fail. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. People, your loved ones are going to, on and on we could go. That's not ever going to be consistent and provide you what you need. And what, but when your heart is attached 
rather than God, that's called idolatry, then when those things are lost to you, it's going to hurt you deep beyond your capacity to handle. The only way you handle those types of things is by being in the Spirit, having momentum in the Spirit, walking in the Lord, making your spiritual life your priority. Bitterness is associated with envy and jealousy. That's James 3.14. Imagined loss of something or jealousy over what someone else has. This was Cain and Abel. Abel got the approval. In 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 11, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was barren and bitter toward the rival wife. The rival wife kept shoving it in her nose. I'm having boys, you know, and you're not having anything. And so she was bitter until she finally humbled herself in prayer and God answered her prayer. So turn to Hebrews 12 in your Bibles. Five through 15. Hebrews 12. This passage is a wonderful passage about God's training program. We call it God's discipline. In the verses 1 through 4, he reminds us of focusing on Christ and running the race with endurance and how the adversities in our life have not brought us to the point of shedding blood. And he says, you... You know, you have forgotten, he said, you have forgotten the, the exhortation addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, he trains, he humbles and, and helps them change. He scourges every son that he receives. For it is for discipline that you endure God, uh, that you endure God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom his father did not discipline? If you are without discipline, which all have become partakers, then you are not actually saved, is what he says. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. We respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of lights and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our benefit, that we may share his holiness, his righteousness. This is about the developing of experiential righteousness. You already have it at salvation. Now you're developing in it a righteous way of living in, in, in the Christian life. So he says, all discipline for the moment is not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Experience, living by experiential righteousness rather than yourself yields peace and contentment. Because you're in the will of God and the Holy Spirit produces peace in your life. So, but bitterness... We're going to look at verses 12 through 15. And before we do, if you'll go back just a couple of pages to chapter 10, verse 32 through 34. This is what they were going through. These are the adversities in the life of these Jewish Christians. So look at verse 32. He says, remember the former days when after being enlightened, that means being saved, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners, accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourself a better position and an abiding one. And then he goes, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. So this is the persecution. All right. 
Paul put them in prison. He took their children and their property. He executed some of them. This is what was going on in the Jewish, in, the, in, in Israel for Christians. They were forcing them to go back to the temple. That's in Hebrews, the crucifying again, the son of God idea. So they're going through it. They're under it. We've not been under it. Nobody in this room has been under it yet. Not like that. It may come. I mean, America's coming apart by the seams, but we'll see. So these Jewish believers, I'm speculating, who thought that Messiah would rescue them from the difficulties of their life and make their human agenda come true. Their prayers is that what God will make our agenda his agenda. When I pray and ask God to fix all of my issues, instead of seeing them as opportunities for growth, I don't want them. They're too hard. They're too difficult. They make me sad. They make me hurt. I don't want it to happen. I want this. I want something more like what I want instead of accepting God's will. Now, I'm not saying don't pray for your issues. Pray it. Like David said, you never know what God would do. Uh, you know, the guy said, well, have you ever won the lottery? Uh, and I said, no. And he said, well, you know, have you ever bought a ticket? I said, it's been a long time. He said, well, you can't win if you don't buy a ticket. You know, you can't, God can't answer your prayer if you don't pray. But the point is, these believers, they had found the Messiah after all these years. Did they wonder if he would fix their human life and make everything just right for them? When he allowed them to be arrested, to have loss of property, loss of children, they were hurt and disillusioned. And we'll see that in a minute. They were disappointed because their expectations were dashed. What they expected God to do, he didn't do. Uh, Rhonda was associated with some people that one of the ladies had someone in their life die. Prayed that he would live. But someone in a position of leadership in that organization said, well, the reason that he died was that you didn't have enough faith. If you'd had enough faith, he'd have been healed. See, that's believing that you can harness God up to serve your ideas, to serve your wants. That doesn't work. That's not the plan of God. The plan of God is God decides the day you're born and the day you die. <laughs> There's no stopping that. So, the idea that you, that, that all of this is about cozying up to God so that God will do what you want and make your life the way you want it to be is, is backwards. It's completely backwards. You don't get it in this life. The book of Hebrews talk about those that died never having received the promises. None, none of the apostles, disciples, apostles died in prosperity. If a developing prosperity would have been the objective, then they would have collected money and built centers for Christianity. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that at all. They used every dime that came in to, for them to do the ministry. They didn't hold on to it, I believe. So, when we get disappointed because of our partner, they don't do what we want. We thought that if you loved me, you would treat me this way. Do you think that that's actually how it works? You get disappointed, you get disillusioned over the loss of what you thought should be. Now I'm going to run out of time, but bitterness results from the frustration and loss of selfish goals in your human agenda. When it comes to relationships, you have this idea about what relationships should be and what you should get from it. That's the reason you enter into it. 
Very few people do I know, young people, that got married so that they could give everything of themselves without getting anything in return. Whoever does that? That's the goal. See, that's what the love your wife like Christ loved the church. That means I'm to love my wife and treat my wife the way God treats me. And God is so patient and allows me to grow. He don't, you know, unless I'm just headed off on, on a horse the wrong way, he doesn't crack down on me. He doesn't beat on me, scourge me. I'm beyond hopefully scourging. Maybe not. But he's patient with me. He encourages me. He, he confronts me. He exposes my false thinking. What a blessing to see where I'm thinking wrong. Why is my life messing up? I'm thinking wrong. How do I know that? It doesn't work. So listen, when it's not working, I'll summarize. When it's not working, when there's conflict, when there's conflict, that the only part of it that is your part is to ask yourself between you and the Lord, what is it that I'm doing? What am I believing, thinking, feeling, and doing that is not the will of God in this relationship? And God will show you that. And then the start of this session about prayer, are you willing to do it? Because if you are, God will take your life and turn it into something special and fantastic. But if you're not, if you will continue making excuses for not letting your, yourself be transformed into the image of Christ, then you're going to hinder your marriage, your children. You're going to pass down what, you were, what was given to you from your parents. And that's, we don't want that. So, bitterness is the exact opposite of the will of God in your relationships. That person is hopefully growing and developing and giving the best that they have. If it's not what you want it to be or not what you expect it to be, you don't really, that's none of your business. I'll say this in close. What each person gives in any relationship is between them and the Lord. What I give to Rhonda and she gives to me, it's up to her. My hope and prayer for her is that she's growing and developing and getting stronger and, and more godly and more spiritual so that what happens between us is more pleasing to the Lord. And same for me. If we're both doing that, you grow into oneness. But when something happens and you get hurt and you get disappointed and they let you down so bad that you stop and you quit and you go off and escape, that's the road to hell in a handbasket. So, Father, a lot of passion in me about this. It's... it's I think it's about the most important lesson we're learning here is in my life anyway, is what am, who and what am I in Christ and how am I living that out? And I see it most clearly in my intimate relationships with my wife and children, with my church. And, and, and you made this so that when things don't go my way, it shows me about me so that I can learn and grow and change to get in line with your will. I pray that we could see that and understand that principle and not just walk away from this Bible study unconvicted, just another study. I'll get to that later. I pray that we could be confronted with it in our lives today. Lord, time is short, especially in our nation. And I just pray for our marriages. I thank you for our pastor. I thank you for those that serve. I love you. I praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.